This is The Rooted Podcast, a conversation about the Christian worldview and its implications for every part of life. The Rooted Podcast is hosted by Steve Royce and Brady Johnson. Together, they have over two decades of experience in the business and tech industries and share a desire to help others filter all of life through the Christian faith. Hi, and thanks for listening to The Rooted Podcast. I'm Steve. And I'm Brady. And on this episode, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the spiritual beings. And uh, that's going to cover a wide range of the episodes that uh, are on the Fruit Snacks. So if you go back to Fruit Snacks episode 121, it's going to go all the way through to 130 and uh, basically cover almost everything that was done in that, uh, minus a few uh, I think the parable and yeah, it'd be the Tuesday episodes. Yeah. But everything else, the yeah, Monday so, and then Wednesday through Friday for both of those weeks. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to get into, uh, the good spiritual beings. We're going to get into, you know, with the guardian angels, we'll get into the bad spiritual beings and, uh, you know, a little bit more, uh, deep dive on demons. So awesome. It's going to be like an episode of supernatural, <laughs> except I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, except, except it'll we'll, actually make sense and be biblical. Yeah, we'll use uh, actual biblical theology. <laughs> and if you don't get the reference, uh, don't worry, you're not missing out on much. Yeah, no, it's just don't more Hollywood garbage uh, about that, that's dressed up like like uh, Christian theology, but actually has nothing to do with it. So anyway, I know it's going to be a lot of content to to cover, but if you want to maybe go over kind of the fifty foot view, fifty foot view, fifty. <laughs> 50,000, 5,000 foot. How many feet you want to go? You, typically it's a uh, standard cruising altitude. So like 30,000, <laughs> like 50,000, you need oxygen. And oh, 50 uh, feet. You can smell the roses. 50, yeah. 50 bit. foot. I've never heard of 50 foot view before. <laughs> so yeah, no, let's, uh, let's go over just a, a very high level view. You pick how many feet it is, but <laughs> with with the spiritual beings there's uh the the basic idea here well, part of why I wanted to cover it is not only because doctrinally it's important and because we in modern our modern context tend to think of the spiritual realm only in terms of God and the angels versus Satan and the demons and the reality is that the bible and the hierarchy of spiritual of the spiritual realm in the Bible is way more varied than that. And there's a lot more nuance to it. There's a lot more, frankly, weird stuff to it than that, that wouldn't have been necessarily very weird to ancient readers, but is weird to us because of how not only have we been influenced by thousands of years of church tradition and stained glass window paintings and traditions and exorcism rites and middle ages theology and you name it, you know, especially, and then also all the, all the Hollywood influence of modern entertainment and just so many different things that have sort of muddied the waters when it comes to spiritual beings and who they are and what they can do and what they can't and, and all this other stuff. And so I thought it would be helpful to go through and kind of just outline who are the players according to scripture. What can we actually affirm out of the Bible and not from, uh, you know, the latest found footage movie that, uh, you know, that picks a random demon uh, name out of a (laughs) 1200s middle ages, you know, uh, monastery text and makes, makes a big deal out of it. So, the the Bible, in terms of the good guys, the Bible affirms different kinds of spiritual beings, which include angels, obviously, but also uh, beings known as cherubim, beings uh, called seraphim, and then also this group called the sons of God, who are also referred to in scripture as the divine council, as God's assembly, or his holy ones. And uh, we talked about also how angels really, technically speaking, are not a type of spiritual being it's a more of a job description and so when a spiritual being is performing the function of delivering a message they are acting 
in that moment as an angel, uh, because an angel is a job. It's, it's, it's a what, it's not really a who. And so we see that as well. And then on the, the bad guy side of things, we have Satan and we have the demons. Uh, but even the demons we talked about are not necessarily the same thing that we tend to think of. They, they may or may not actually be fallen angels, uh, and even angels, I want to put that that asterisk next to because of what I just said about how angels is really not a who, it's more of a what. Um, there's some thoughts on in Jewish tradition that they might be actually the spirits of dead Nephilim and so on and so forth. But then in they're really some of the least powerful, if you're making a direct comparison, bad spiritual beings that are out there because you also have these fallen sons of God who once were part of the divine council, but have since rebelled and um, have given up that that place in pursuit of their own authority and worship and all these other things. And as powerful as they are, they are subservient to the devil because he was the first spiritual rebel, and so he's he's just sort of the leader because. He, he did it first. He was the trailblazer. And um, even just how he has authority over death because of the curse that we find uh, that God lays down upon him in Genesis chapter 3. So there's a lot more to it, but there's also a lot of uh, smoke and mirrors to kind of cut through and, and to, to uh, just kind of throw by the wayside of just ideas about spiritual beings that we get from our culture, we get from our entertainment or from Christian tradition that just frankly aren't found in the Bible. So I thought it would be helpful to kind of give a, a biblical overview and and kind of set help set the record straight at least as much as as I'm able to do. So yeah, it was it was a lot, but I think it was it's cool and I hope that people find it not only interesting but but helpful because um you know, thinking wrongly about spiritual beings can lead to, especially the bad ones, can lead Christians to anxiety and worry and fears that I think are just unfounded when you look at what the Bible actually says about them and the authority that we now have in Jesus over them. And so there, there's no reason for a Christian to feel those things. And so if, if going through this, these topics can help with that, then, then that's, that's a win. Yeah, and I really liked, you know, going through and, and just thinking through some of the different depictions that we've heard over the years and, and really kind of putting those in check and thinking about, you know, what these beings really are. And I know you've talked in some previous episodes as well about kind of the roles that some of them play um, and kind of alluding towards this conversation of, you know, spiritual be- beings as a whole, both, you know, good and bad and how that can play a larger part in how we observe what's being said in the Bible and you know, what, what scripture we're reading. And, you know, it's interesting to think about, I mean, it's just funny cause you know, we were, uh, hanging out last, was it last Sunday mm-hmm. and you showed me that picture where is the do not be afraid. Yeah. The meme where there's a, uh, this ball of eyes with like eight wings coming out of it. And it says, don't be afraid. And the person's standing there going, sir, I've never been more terrified in my entire <laughs> life. Yeah, exactly. Cause and it's supposed to be this like biblically accurate depiction of a, of a spiritual being. And even that isn't, it's like, you know, it, it's probably closest to a seraphim, but even a seraphim wasn't just a ball of eyes with wings, but it's the idea of saying like, yeah, spiritual beings are a lot weirder than, uh, than maybe we we think. Although, again, if you look at angels, which in that case it would have been an angel, angels almost always exclusively appear to look just like people. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> well, that was that's what I was going to say is you know between you know our conversation about just that picture and kind of laughing about that picture, you know, you put into that perspective of why they say do not be afraid. Yeah, you know, you're you're going to run into some spiritual beings that you know if they show themselves, you're you're not really prepared for what you're going to see. Yeah. And then on the other side of the coin, like you just said, you know, with angels, you may not be able to tell. Right. And so I think it's, it's interesting to, to take that into perspective when we're talking about spiritual beings Yeah, is there is kind of, you know, obviously visual differences as well as kind of these roles that you laid out is, you know, some of them are more like job titles. And so when we look at scripture and we're talking, we're hearing, 
you know, comparisons being drawn and it's, it's more about the position that they're holding as it relates to God and his kingdom. And, you know, I think you use David as a reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, where you really see the sort of fear of these spiritual beings, uh, uh, show up in the Bible Mm -hmm. is in places where people like namely the prophets have these visions Mm -hmm. of being in God's immediate presence in his actual throne room in heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six, where he's caught up into God's throne room to receive his commission. And (laughs) there are the spiritual beings that are in God's throne room, which would be cherubim and seraphim. Mm-hmm. And Isaiah is, he, he falls down. Like he's undone. He's just like, Oh my goodness, where am I? <laughs> like, and even John in, in revelation, yeah. he's in God's immediate presence. And so the spiritual beings that are around him are there again, most likely cherubim and seraphim. Cause that's their job. Mm-hmm. And John begins to worship one of them. And he says, what are you doing? Get up. I'm just a, I'm just a created being like you. Right. And, And so you have these examples where the people who encounter spiritual beings, when they are sort of caught up into, into God's realm or area, that's when they are sort of overcome with this, uh, awe or fear of, of just what in the world am I looking at kind of a thing. But Mm -hmm. when the spiritual beings make their way to us as in angels, uh, you don't see as much of that because when they come to us, they, I think in a way they condescend to our sensibilities and they, they look like us. But, uh, when you're in their backyard, uh, I think some of these passages or even Ezekiel seeing these creatures that he couldn't, he could barely describe because they just look different than anything else he had seen before. And, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's that when you, when you, uh, sort of cross over into the heavenly realm in, in scripture, that's when you see things kind of at more as they really are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, but that's not really the picture or the idea that you get. You don't ever, I, I can't think of a, a single example where someone sees an, an angel and it's described any way other than looking like a human. Mm-hmm. I don't, we don't see examples in scripture really that I can think of where, uh, a seraphim as such or a cherubim as such appears to someone mm-hmm. and, and delivers a message. Cause that's not, it's not their job. It's mm-hmm. not their role. Um, it's someone else's job to do that stuff. Right. Yeah. And I think the jobs thing was interesting to, to really think about. I don't, I don't think I really thought about it in that way before, you know, going through and, and listening to what you had to say. And it really did make me pause and think about, you know, obviously how I've been reading scripture and, you know, how I maybe attribute qualities to a type of spiritual being rather than a role within spiritual beings, you know, and it helped me, you know, kind of wrap my head a little bit further around kind of what we have to expect, you know, as Christians, as believers, when we, you know, are in God's presence for all of eternity, that we will have jobs we'll have Mm -hmm. roles within the kingdom. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's an area that I haven't spent a lot of time in, in study and, and thought too much about. I mean, just kind of superficially knowing that, you know, for all eternity, I'll be doing something, but thinking about it more as these roles of, of, you know, priority. And, you know, as you talked about, I think in one of the later, um, on the good guys talking about kind of how those roles play into his current kingdom Mm -hmm. and how we'll be taking over for, you know, some of the fallen. And so it's, it's just an interesting perspective to to spend some time to to think on and pray on and and start studying on. Yeah, well, and even the the satans, right? These mm-hmm. these guys that you see in the Old Testament in books like Zechariah and Job, who I I really you know again because of the grammar, uh, it's not really a, an interpretive option to see them as the devil. Um, because yeah. theologically it doesn't make sense that after Genesis three, he's cast out of that realm. He doesn't have the, he doesn't have the clearance to just stroll back into God's presence mm-hmm. that's been removed. And so we have a, we have an interpretive problem, you know, from Genesis three to getting back to Job chapter one of like, how does that work then? 
But then just this idea of the Satans who, again, maybe were the good guys and they had just, they had a job to do and they were doing their job and they were doing it well. And and it helps us conceive of the kingdom of God more as a a kingdom. Like, and Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really odd to say, like, we talk about the kingdom of God all the time, but I don't think we really think of it working like a yeah. kingdom. Oh, exactly. Right. That's, Where that's what I was saying. there's all these moving parts. There's all mm-hmm. these moving pieces. There's busyness always of different people doing different tasks and who have delegated roles and responsibilities to them from people who are above them, who have delegated roles and responsibilities and the whole kingdom just sort of working like this, this mechanism. Yeah. And it all flows from God. God has set it up this way and he has delegated authority to people to delegate authority to people because he, he enjoys participating along with his creations. We see this in that example. And I think it's first or second Kings where, uh, God is soliciting feedback from his council about, so we're going to judge Ahab, but how should we do it guys? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm open to ideas here. Right. And again, not because God needs ideas, but because he's, he's that way. And so, yeah, it's one of those really neat things to think about that um, he has roles and responsibilities for every spiritual being he's created and for every human he's created. And that eventually, I mean, even now the new Testament talks about us. This is that this is one of those themes in the Bible of this already, but not yet thing Mm -hmm. that you get all the time in scripture of like the kingdom of God is already here because it, it was in breaking when Jesus came. And yet It's not yet because it hasn't fully been realized. And so, again, in the same way, we are now already sons and daughters of God. We already, Mm -hmm. in terms of authority, have replaced these fallen sons of God. We are already family. We already have an inheritance. And yet, not yet, because we're not actually there yet. And so we Mm -hmm. can't enjoy it in its full capacity yet. But we have the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of all those things that are going to eventually come as a promise. And so, yeah, there's this, um, there's this a little bit of a tension there, but it's, it's neat to think about that. Yeah, it really is a kingdom and it really functions like a kingdom. Uh, and God and his host are busy about the work of this kingdom. They're not passive right now as things are swirling in, in our world and going on They're They're very, very busy and they're active and they're engaged doing things behind the scenes that we just can't see most of the time. But that doesn't mean because we can't see it, that there's not a lot of flurry of activity going yeah. on in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is always active just, just as the kingdom of darkness is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's good to, to get those misconceptions of, you know, maybe what is portrayed of everyone sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. I so, can't even with that stuff. <laughs> it's just so like there, it's again, another example of how our culture is like screwed things up. Like for instance, when you really start to parse out like uh, what out of what we think about when we, when we commonly think about certain things really has nothing to do with the Bible. Mm-hmm. For instance, when, and I'm, I'm not saying you, you personally, I'm just saying you generally of people, when you think about the devil, what do you picture in your head? Yeah, it's always going to be your your horned red demon with a a pitchfork and a yeah spiky red right? tail or whatever, and you know probably some sort of like cloven or hooved legs or mm-hmm. something, right? Yeah, and it's like so. Let's run that out and let's find that nowhere in scripture. First of all, do you find any description even close to that? Mm-hmm. That is way more close to the 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 Roman uh, pan. Mm-hmm. Uh, this like sort of goat. Yep. person right that you get or some sort of some sort of hybrid creature from greek and roman mythology part of their pantheon mm-hmm. then you get from actual scripture same thing with cherubim how how did we how did we end up with hallmark cards of these little like <laughs> naked baby butts with like you know or cupid yeah, right cupid, arrows, cupid yeah. literally comes from roman yeah, mythology exactly and and this idea of these little you know infants with wings flying around shooting shooting arrows at people uh or just floating around on on clouds it's like okay these cherubim are not described that way at all (laughs) in scripture so where does that come from it comes from 
it comes from Greek and Roman mythology. And so we have had our thinking infiltrated by pagan uh, pantheons, pagan mythology, and and theology, and it has really fundamentally um, misled us. When we when we think about these things, mm-hmm. we're not thinking about them as they really are. Right. We're thinking about a version of them that doesn't actually exist, and that's where that's where if you if there's a so what in all this, that's where it is. It's they say if thinking about God, I think it was. I think it was C.S. Lewis uh, who said that the most important thought that a person can enter. Oh, it was uh, A.W. Tozer. He said at the beginning of his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, that the most important thought that a human mind can entertain is whatever they think about God. And if that's the most important thought that a person can have, then whatever they're thinking about God, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it better be accurate. Because if we're not thinking accurately about God, then what are we thinking of, right? right? If we're if we're thinking of some version of God that is different than the way God actually is, then in a way that's an idol, right? We're thinking about something else, but it's not God. Right. And the same is true with spiritual beings, not in a not in a worshipful sense, but if we're not thinking about these things the way the Bible describes them, then what are we thinking about? We're thinking about some version of them that we've sort of concocted in our imagination, we're not thinking about reality. It's fantasy at that point. Right. And and so if we can clear up as much of that as possible, then that's that's the goal. That's good because precision and accuracy is it's important. Because if you allow some of that stuff to infiltrate, it's like also then you start to like there the, the Bible is very clear about what the purposes are of some of these beings, what their goals are. Um, and so if you don't understand their role that they play and their goals and their purpose and what they're actually aiming for, then you're going to completely misunderstand or misread certain situations that we even find ourselves in today, like with the sons of God and their, their control over the nations and, and national spiritual uh, influence and things like that, that it's just the, the, again, from right from Genesis 10 and 11 in the tower of Babel, like the ancients would have taken for granted that we just, we don't even think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's great to, to kind of put that in check. I actually wanted to do a more of a quick fire, go through each of the, the different, uh, yeah, let's do it. Uh, spiritual beings and kind of do a contrast of maybe common misconceptions. I know we kind of threw out the joke of supernatural early on. So uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll uh, address some of those yeah, pretty sure. quickly, but let's, uh, so you already did kind of the cherubim and, and seraphim. Is there anything else you think is common misconception with those? Honestly, I feel like one of the biggest misconceptions, especially with seraphim is that they don't get thought about at all. Yeah. If they get thought about, they probably get thought about wrongly, like mm-hmm. in the case of the cherubim. But I think it's far more common that they just don't get thought about. Yeah. I think most people, when they even think of the little, you know, the little baby butt angels flying around, it, it's not even cherubim. It's like they think of cherubs as baby angels. Right. Because again, there's a so it's like an angel, angels, like cherubs are a class of angel, mm-hmm. I guess, would be the way of it. So again, not okay. accurate, yeah. not biblical. And, but yeah, that's probably the biggest misconception about cherubs is that they're like a, they're like angel light. Mm -hmm. beings and it's like no they're temple security they're uh they're the big bads you have to get through to get to god and you ain't getting to god through Mm -hmm. them you know kind of a thing they're they're far more intimidating and otherworldly than some sort of cupid like thing that's flying around okay uh angels no wings (laughs) (laughs) red bull might give you wings but angels don't and it's just (laughs) yeah angels don't have wings like you you can't find a single verse in scripture that would describe an angel uh, when it appears to someone as that, that just doesn't happen. Uh, And again, when you do have angels described like in Genesis and Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot or in, uh, in the tomb account and in Mark's gospel, they look like people. They just look like people and people assume that they're people and they interact with people. And again, the writer of Hebrews says, be careful how you treat strangers because you might accidentally entertain an angel. And some people have, it's like, Mm -hmm. well, you know, if they're hiding a six foot wingspan under their, under their trench coat, then it's going to be pretty hard to mistake them for a dude. But 
the writer of Hebrews just takes for granted that they can be mistaken for people. So that should tell us that they, you know, they're not packing, uh, you know, big, long, fluffy white wings, Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere under there. It's just not, it's just not what we find. Yeah. They tuck it away in their trench coat with their halo. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But they just, they're detachable, I guess. Yeah. All right. Uh, he kind of did the devil. Yeah, no pitchfork or horns or anything like that. In fact, the Bible describes him as appearing often as as an as an angel of light, mm-hmm. right? So you get this idea that if you met if you met the devil, uh, you probably wouldn't know it was the devil. Mm-hmm. That's the whole point, right? Is that he's a liar, he's a deceiver. He's not going to come to you and and present himself as what he really is because you don't deceive people <laughs> that right. way. Okay. Sons of God. Sons of God. Uh, again, one. <laughs> I don't know that. I think the biggest thing here, I think people maybe just don't think about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if they do, again, I think the host of God is probably most often thought of as just a bunch of angels mm-hmm. standing around or floating around or flying, flittering around on their wings that they don't have, <laughs> uh, playing harps that yeah. they aren't holding. Right. It's like, no, no, no. Whoever is standing around God is probably he's like, again, the cherubs. What we see in Genesis, he's placed in the Garden of Eden with us, flaming sword. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a musical instrument, y'all. Mm-hmm. I mean, it might be a cool name for a band, but it's not an instrument. And so, yeah, you've got that. Uh, the the same thing with the sons of God. I'm not sure they get thought about. I mean, even there's there's even Bible translations like the, the, the King James, for instance. And I'm not going to pick on the King James, but in this instance, uh, the King James in like Psalm 82, uh, I think it even renders the the sons of God there as the rulers of Israel. It's literally what it calls them, mm-hmm. even though those words aren't there in the Hebrew, but they're just sort of interpreting. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what we're ta- that's who we're talking about. Right. But contextually, it doesn't make sense because you go to Psalm 89 and if we're talking about the same the same Hebrew words, rulers of Israel doesn't work because the rulers of Israel aren't in heaven. Mm-hmm. Right. Um which is where they're described in Psalm 89, I believe. So you just have some interpretive problems. But again, like there, I think there are there are ideas where they just sort of get swept under the rug and they, they're not really thought about as a separate group. Um, but they they are. That's what the Bible that's what the Bible teaches us. They're not angels, they're not cherubim, they're not seraphim, they're something else. And what exactly they look like, what exactly like, again, we're not we're not really told. Uh, but they are they are distinct. They are unique. Yeah. And then us as sons of God. Us as sons of God. So I think the biggest misconception about that is that we don't really consider or maybe even take seriously this idea that we're going to have work to do when in the life to come when we get to the new heaven and the new earth and, and the creation there. That this is... That, that, that everything that we do in this life is intended to be a preparation for what we're going to do in the next life. And so what we do now matters that right now counts forever as one of my college professors said. And I took that so much to heart. It's like, it's been one of my email addresses for a long time is that, that right now matters forever that the decisions we make today are going to echo in eternity. And mm-hmm. I just don't know that very many Christians actually take that seriously, that, that this idea that um, how I live has nothing to do with my salvation. That's, that's bought and paid for by Jesus. As long as I continue to believe and trust that that promises it, that what God promised that he's going to do, then I'm good on that front. But what I do and how I choose to live my life is going to, is going to impact how my next life looks. And so therefore, if that's, if that's true, like Paul seems to suggest it is in first Corinthians three, I think 11 through 15, then we should take every day far more seriously as Christians. We should take far more seriously the choices we make, the intentionality that we have or don't have for how we're living. And yeah, I mean, there's just a lot there to consider. I, I think we, we think, I think a lot of people think we're going to be bored in heaven and that's just not the case. Um, I think we're going to be busy in heaven. And if, if you thought that you were, 
Uh, if you thought that this life was like an apprenticeship for the life to come, then we might make different decisions. Yeah. So I think that's, that's the big, that's the big sort of pivot. I think when it comes to us, that's a good one. All right, let's do uh demons. Oh man. <laughs> Everything you've seen in Hollywood is basically yeah. wrong. Let's just start there. First of all, every bad guy in Hollywood movies is a demon. If it's not a ghost, if it's not an angry dead person's ghost, then it's a demon of some sort. And these demons like range from like being in charge of all of hell, which again, it's like Satan is not a demon. That's not what he is. He's never described that way. He's described as a guardian cherub that was cast down, that was fallen as the Lord of the dead, but he's never once described as a demon. And so we've got that, but then, you know, demons are just doing all kinds of ridiculous stuff in, in entertainment to people. And again, if you look at what they do in scripture, first of all, they oppress individuals, they possess individuals. So they are very limited in their ability to uh, influence uh, human beings compared to something like a fallen son of God. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of like what they are, I mean, again, I I'll put it this way. I've had experiences where I have, uh, I'm looking back, I'm, I'm fairly sure that I was dealing with evil spiritual presence. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I know some of my professors from from grad school have dealt with people who uh, were directly under evil spiritual influence. And everything that they experienced in uh, even their very intense interactions never was really any different than what you see in Scripture. There were times where their physical bodies were affected, uh, where they... Uh, they like, for instance, started to pray and then found that they, they don't, didn't have the voice to pray. They, their voice had been taken away. So guess what? You just start praying in your mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And, and also like it's same thing that I, I encountered when I was, um, when I was younger, I had a, a experience where I, I just felt very strongly, like there was a, a very evil spiritual presence in the room. I just started praying and, and I just said, look, God, you have the authority, and this is in Jesus' name, uh, by his authority, uh, I'm telling you to leave and don't come back. And it was it was literally as simple as that of just saying, I, I know who I am, I know who you are, and therefore I know that I can tell you to leave. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I'm anything special, but it's because of who I belong to. And he has delegated his authority to me so that when I'm speaking to you in his name, it's like he's speaking to you. And I know you have to listen to him because in scripture, this is what you see, right? No demon ever back back sassed Jesus. <laughs> they just didn't, they yeah. didn't have the authority. They couldn't do it. They had to listen because yeah. of who he was. And we have that same authority indwelling us through the Holy spirit because Paul even calls the Holy spirit, the spirit of Christ. So there's a direct link here. And we need to understand who we are. We need to understand who they are. We need to understand that because of that, um, in a very literal way, while they are to be taken seriously, we outrank them. Um, and and again, that's not because we're anything special. It's because we've been made sons and daughters of God through, through the blood of Jesus. Yeah. And so we have the spiritual authority to tell them, you know, to go pound sand. <laughs> and that's that you need to understand that because we shouldn't live in fear of these beings. Uh, but every time they're portrayed in Hollywood, it's just like they, first of all, I have yet to see a, a Bible believing Christian portrayed in any of these movies. It's either some right. wackadoo priest who turns out to be the, the, the bad guy, right? <laughs> right. Cause they love to do that twist. Or it's just a bunch of kids who decided to try a seance. And it's like, guess what? None of them are believers. Mm -hmm. So whatever's happening to them, they have no authority to stop it whatsoever mm -hmm. from a Christian worldview perspective. And so they really are victims or at, at the, at the, the whim of whatever it is that they're dealing with. But either way, just what you see there, it's, um, it's intended to entertain and it's intended to shock and do all those things. But the reality is, is that Christians don't need to, don't need to 
think that for a second that you need to live in fear, or anxiety, or worry about these or any spiritual being, even the devil, we're told that we can stand firm against him and resist him and he will flee from us. Uh, right. And so uh, there's just a, uh, there's just a confidence level that I hope that people have once they understand sort of what the, the, the way that the board is set and who, which, which piece we are on the board. we tend to think of ourselves as pawns and it's like, nah, not if you're a son and daughter of God, you're, yeah. um, you're, you know, I'm using chess analogies here <laughs> very, very, uh, uh, clumsily, but it's like, we're, we're more like bishops and rooks. Like we, we have some considerable power to, to, uh, to shape the board here. And I think as Christians, we just don't take care. We don't take advantage of it often enough. And and we should, cause that's unfortunate. Yeah. And I think it, it is important that we look at the media that we consume, you know, whatever show it is or yes. movie or whatever. Yeah. And make sure that we're not letting that influence our, our perspective on our belief here and in, in what scripture we read. And yeah, I mean, my wife, she had a hard time with supernatural. She had a con- personal conviction and, you know, she had to square that out before even considering watching it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's important that if you find yourself in a position where, you know, the media you're consuming is, is starting to, you know, cause issues with the word of God, you know, given to those convictions and, uh, make sure you're squared up. Yeah. And, and that's where too, I mean, it, a lot of this is, it, a lot of this is going to depend on just how, how confident you are and how much scripture you have in you. Um, because like there where I'm not, I'm not the Holy spirit, neither is Brady. We're not the media police either. We're not here to tell you <laughs> right. what you should and shouldn't do. What we are saying is, just like, you know, be careful what you put in, especially if it's not proportional to the amount of scripture that you've put in. Mm. If you understand the the game, you know, in terms of the spiritual hierarchy and, and all this stuff, and you've you've studied this stuff and you understand sort of where things all stand. Frankly, I can watch some of this entertainment, even though I think a lot of it is not edifying because of the other elements that are often involved, like right. all the sexual exploitation and all the the coarse language and just other stuff that really just there's no reason to put that in your brain but in terms of just the spiritual elements there i can watch some of this stuff and and honestly it's it's for me it's almost a form of entertainment because i I get to compare it to what i know of scripture and just Mm -hmm. like wait man how how creatively did they screw this up Mm -hmm. right (laughs) and it's almost uh it's just interesting in a way to be to look at it and go man um would they would they bungle now, right? And just kind of yeah. see like, oh wow, they they uh, they they took this these randomly thing random things that aren't connected at all, and then they they drew this really weird connection between them, and now they've sort of done something new. And uh, it's it's at times entertaining, but in no way does it influence my thinking about the Bible or the actual spiritual realm. Like there, we were right. talking about like supernatural and we're just picking on supernatural cause it's, it's in the news cause it just ended after 15 seasons. So even if you've been living under a rock, you've probably seen some kind of pop up about the show at some point recently, but just this idea of like, you know, there we can look at it and say all the, all the terminology that they use in the show is directly drawn from a Christian worldview, a Judeo Christian worldview, because characters in the show yeah they've got angels they've got demons they've got nephilim they've got leviathans they've got uh all these you know death and they've got god and they've got archangels and all these other things and lucifer except none of them not a single one of them is even close to accurate from a biblical perspective so what they've done is they've created a completely different universe it's a fantasy universe and they just happen to use Christian worldview terms for these fantasy creatures that they've created, including God. Mm-hmm. And so if you can, if you can, you know, watch it with sort of that understanding of just like, this is basically sci-fi, right? Um, because there's nothing about this that even remotely resembles the actual way things really are, then it, it's just, it's just different. It changes your perspective, I think. And so the, 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 the encouragement through this is to say, 
know what the Bible says first, Mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to see far more accurately and clearly what entertainment in the world is sort of trying to throw at you. And you'll be able to recognize the spin that they're putting on it far more easily. And it, and it won't bother you because when you see some of this stuff and you go, okay, well, I just know that's not, that's not even close to truth. Like spiritual beings can't do that (laughs) because that's not a biblical thing. Right. And, and so yeah, it's just, it's helpful the more scripture you get in you, the, the, the more peace it brings, the more calm it brings and the less anxiety and worry there is, especially when it comes to the, the supernatural realm um, of, of spiritual beings and stuff. Yeah. It's fascinating. I'll, I'll give, I'll be the first one to say that. I think it's endlessly interesting, but you can get into speculation really, really fast. And that's why it's important to anchor ourselves to scripture first. Right. And then, and then we, very tenuously sort of branch out to say, say, so what can we sort of tie together systematically? Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, just say, guess what? Scripture doesn't tell us. So I'm not going to speculate about that. Right. Um, but that's where, that's where Hollywood thrives is mm-hmm. on speculation. speculation. Yeah. Well, and this kind of ties back into with uh, what we talked about during our sales process evangelism, when you're, you know, maybe speaking with someone who has a different faith and you're using the same vernacular. Yeah. You know, you may think you're talking about the same thing, or you may be consuming media that you think is talking about the same thing, but just because it's called the same, yeah, it's not, doesn't mean it is the same. And yeah. so, having that grounding in scripture first, you know, helps both in your media consumption as well as you know your evangelism with others who 100%. have a different faith. So, yeah, good stuff, dude. Awesome. Well, that's all we have for uh, today's episode. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions or any thoughts, feel free to drop us a line. Uh, but we uh, appreciate you guys listening. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the Rooted Podcast, a creation of Rooted Productions and an affiliate of the Oasis Church in Gilbert, Arizona. For more information about the podcast or to submit a question or comment, please visit us at rooted.productions. Follow us on Instagram at rooted.productions or email podcast at rooted.productions. That's rooted.productions. We hope you'll join us next time.